Oh my. Mate, it's the nuts. <laughs> it's gone from the sublime to ridiculous. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it feels lethal. It's what I'm it should have built. <laughs> customers, supporters and followers a Merry Christmas 2019 and I'm proud to show you our very latest G-Wagon creation. This car has been developed in the background of our busy workshop over the past six months uh, and we've ironed out lots of little issues that people come up against uh, when building high powered G-Wagons. Uh, one of the main issues being addressed is cooling. Now some of the uh, cooling issues most of them arise when you're trying to make bigger power numbers. So this, um, these kits are 300 horsepower. When you come up against that, you're going to start to encounter these issues. Some of these cooling modifications include ceramic coated manifold and turbocharger, fully sealed cold air intake system, aesthetically pleasing CNC alloy wing intake, W463 aluminium radiator conversion, block cooling modifications, header tank installation, integrated oil cooler system, and fully armoured low mount intercooler. So all this means you can tow overland, motorway commute with good power figures with no concern of the vehicle overheating. And when I mention good power figures, I'm talking about genuine dyno proven power figures, not just an estimated number because you think you might have an idea. This is all tested measured figures. Right, so all this stuff's been tested in my own vehicle, um, running at a much higher horsepower level. So we've kind of pushed this setup to the extreme. <laughs> technically what's been sold to the customers is kind of a milder and even more safe version. The second, the second hurdle we needed to overcome with this conversion was to supply our customers with a strong six-speed transmission that can handle the abuse, the off-road abuse, towing and all the other things that people are going to do with the G-Wagon. Um, some of the things that I insisted on with this is the ease of fitment when sold in a crate package. Um, transmission shift feel I wanted to be excellent, smooth, vibra vibration free operation uh, and repeatable part production so in five years we can still supply the exact same kit or replacement parts should any of the parts fail. Uh, to manage this massive task we've designed and machined our own brackets in-house with the CNC machine, uh, linkages, flywheels, clutches, all those components we designed and fabricated and we have control of them making them in-house so that makes life really nice right okay next or well, lastly finally let's talk about the most important part which is the engine and uh, and the small tweaks the developments and things that make our engines really quite special and the attention to detail now the easiest way for me to be able to show you these points is going to be on um, this vehicle we basically have three replica setups that are exactly the same as this. Um, well, one actually has a slightly milder turbo, but apart from that, all the same, that are going to customers overseas, uh, mainly America, Canada. So let's take you over there and show you how many parts are actually involved in a kit and what you actually get. Um, obviously, we've got quite an array of bits here. Uh, from the transmission to the intercool, the radiator, the airboxes, the pipework, the clutch, and obviously your, your, your engine. But let's not get too bogged down in the amount of parts we have here. We'll cover the parts of the engine that make it special. Right, firstly, let's cover the, the billet turbocharger. You can see it is nicely mounted there on the ceramic uh, coated manifold. These manifolds are coated internally and externally. The turbine housing is also coated. Um, and the turbocharger is a billet unit, completely upgraded, larger shaft, larger wheels, 
um, and it's absolutely awesome for this application. Fast spool, loads of power, which I'm sure you'll see later in the video. Uh, secondly, this is complemented with our 7.7mm mechanical injector pumps. They're built in-house. Um, you'll see one of these running on the test stand uh, later on in the video. Um, we also have the upgraded steel internal water pump, which you can't really see. It's hidden behind our smaller water pump pulley. Um, but that's more for reliability. The water pump pulley obviously aids for the cooling. Um, OEM specification replacement blow cuts, including recut seats. That's again something you can't really see, but it's in there. You're going to have to trust us on that one. All the internal engine deposits, the carbon deposits, sorry, uh, have been clean. Um, the uh, engine has totally been refinished in a durable high temperature um, two pack finish, which is really, really quite nice. It's easy to keep it clean, easy to see any leaks or any other problems that may arise. And then finally, the inlet manifold has been coated in an attractive crackle black, but very durable finish. Uh, and again, they're internally carbon clean, they're like new inside. So all of this adds up to a crank crankshaft figure of 300 horsepower and 400 pounds feet. Um, naturally, we're gonna see some power loss when we go through the G-Wagon's drivetrain. At the wheels, you're gonna see a lower number, but that's basically what these uh, hybrid setups will put out. We're, we've also pioneered um, the uh, the cast aluminium sump. Um, now, in in 2016, Mercedes discontinued the G Wagon specific sumps, so we had to take it upon ourselves to have these cast. We machined these in the house and have added extra material to strength critical areas, and also added a little bit of cooling, um, as you can see by some some fins. But take this time to have a quick look underneath um, at the various bits and pieces. Apologies that there's a little bit of a, a bit of road scale on there, but we've been using this. Um, but you can see the mount. Now this mount is absolutely fantastic. Really, really uh, heavy duty, big, thick aluminium, and it bolts tight to this tube. So you don't have to do any welding at home. You don't have to do any special fabrication to mount this. It is literally a clamp on application. And then when you're happy with the position, the location, you put a little lock bolt in there, uh, drill through, tap the actual tube, and then that locks that up. You can see this is the, the torque arm that we've put on there to, to support the transfer case. Uh, and then you can see all the other little bits and pieces, you know, the adapter plate and things. Now, the only thing that doesn't come in the kit is um, the stainless steel exhaust system. Now, that may be something that we can offer at a later date, um, but you can sort of see to the standard if you were bringing your vehicle into the workshop that uh, that these are welded. Um, we put a hell of a lot of pride into the, the welding and the fabrication, um, but we're not quite confident to jig that up uh, to sell overseas. Again, like I say, it may be something that we'll do in the future. So thank you very much for watching this. And the next part of the video, you're going to see a very thorough um, explanation uh, and a very thorough breakdown of how to install this whole package into your G-Wagon at home um, using a kit just like this. And this video has been made for the guys um, that we're, we're sending these kits to and others like them in the future. So if you have any problems or you get stuck or you, you come up against any issues, even if you're building a G-Wagon and you haven't built, you know, bought one of our kits, if you come up against issues, then, you know, give us a call, give us an email. We've got the experience. We'd love to share it with you. Um, and also we'd like to, ex to share your experiences. If there's some things that you've done and you think they're pretty good, then We'd love to see it. All right, thanks a lot. Enjoy the video and have a Merry Christmas. Bye. Right, so this uh, has already had its underpants removed. And by underpants, I mean the original steering guard. Uh, because we were using it for a little bit of development um, when we were building the, the nice intercooler um, undershield. Right, secondly, you want to take the bumper off. As you can see here, you got one there, and then there's one a little bit deeper in, which you can just see there. I'll get my torch out. There it is. Are you even, can you even see that? Yep, there we go. So that one and that one. Pull them out, both sides, bumper slides off. And then you want to take off your grill, your slam panel, this kind of like little grill thing that goes between the main grill and the bumper. Take all that off. 
So you're basically going to be making way for the engine and gearbox, the complete setup, to come straight out of the front. And we're going to take that out as all one piece, and I'll show you why. We've got, this is a manual, uh, originally um, OM617. Well, this is the original setup. So what you have here is um, the intermediate prop shaft that goes between the gearbox and the transfer case. It has two UJs and it has eight bolts on either side. Now, they're, they're not the most fun thing to undo. Some of them, if they're seized, they can be a nightmare, blah, blah, blah. But the good news is you don't need to undo them because that is a spline shaft that slides together. You're gonna take that whole engine and gearbox and literally slide it out and it will slide off that prop shaft. Now, if you don't know how a prop shaft should go together, I'll tell you now. Um, basically, the, the yokes, the two yokes on the end of the prop shaft should be identical to each other. So if you imagine that's like a UJ, this is one, this is the other, and then it has the spider in between. If this is one shaft with two yokes on the end, they have to be aligned. They don't want to be like this or like this or like this. They should be uh, perfectly aligned. So if you put a flat edge, the two sort of C's are on the same plane. Um, so when you come to put that back together, that's worth remembering. So it's as simple as that. We're going to whip that front end off. We're going to slide that engine and gearbox out. It's, what day is it? Tuesday? Tuesday afternoon-ish. I will have this out in an hour or so. Um, it's not that bad a job. You've just got to not be scared of the rusty bits. If a rusty bit stands in your way, chop it off. If that includes the whole front of the vehicle, chop it off. I don't care. Just do it. Right, let's get cracking. Hi again, so right, we're taking the bumper off, I've taken those four bolts out and then you've got your two spotlights to contend with. Do what I'm doing now and just unbolt the spotlights and then you can leave them hanging. You can obviously disconnect the wire from inside the lamp but again, we, all the vehicles we're going to try and disturb as little as possible to give as little headache as possible. We want to fix the things a little bit at a time, we don't want to try and take on the world at once. Bumper off. Put that somewhere safe. Find yourself a trusty tub to put all your little bits and pieces in. And now you can get access to the grill. Remember the grill has uh, the hose for the washer jets. So that'll need to be disconnected. And then this cross panel, and we can start taking the radiator out. It's worth noting at this point to start draining your fluids, your coolants, your oils, and all that other stuff so that when you come to whipping that radiator out, it's already drained, it's not slowing you down, and you can just keep moving and moving and moving. Take out your positive drive screws, chuck them in your tub. So on the back of here, like I was saying, you've got a hose for the washer jet. Now, you've got to be careful with this, because sometimes, it'll try and squirt water all over you. Mm. Like that. Amazing. <laughs> yeah! They're not coming out, use a figure. There we go. Cheers for up there. And see, um, you know, the kind of condition of your vehicle. Now, if you look in there, this is meant to be all one piece. Um, and you can see there's already a rust hole in there and that's the kind of thing you're going to find on a G-Wagon. Um, so obviously be, be aware of that. You can see on this one, um, this one was obviously uh, of a similar standard and you can see there, you can still see the original labels where the inner wings and everything have been replaced on my car because that is all part of the inner wing that I've just showed you, it goes right down into there. So be prepared, either doing a lot of welding or a lot of parts buying. I went for parts buying because I'd already done a lot of welding. Right, so next we're going to take off the cross member. Uh, we're going to take the lock out so that we don't have to disconnect the, um, the bonnet release cable. We're going to move that out of the way. We're going to take the radiator and all that kind of thing out. But like I said, we're going to drain it first so that that's done and out of the way.
pressures, very important, don't lose them. Right, now this cross member can pull out. That is, Right, you want the oil cooler to stay with the engine, so we're going to disconnect the oil cooler from the radiator. And we're going to do that with the hose, and then press in, and press. Radiator is out, I lifted it out, it was really straightforward, we're taking the hoses off. You can see the oil cooler is still connected. Um, so the next job, I'm going to disconnect some wiring for the alternator, the starter motor, the glow plugs, undo the exhaust, uh, take some of the exhaust off from underneath. I'm going to take this air box off, so that's really to go forward um, because we don't need that anymore. That then gives you access for your alternator wiring. Those little terminal posts. Now, another brilliant thing on these cars. Those terminal posts always corrode and what happens, you try and undo the nuts and it rips the whole pedestal out of there. So, in advance, just pop that open, that little lid, which allows you to get into there. Give it a squirt with your best stuff. And then leave it to soak. Right, so I'm going to show you something that's worth noting. Okay, if you look at the injector pump, this is the 617 engine that we're removing to put the 606 engine in. Um, you can see there's two brown hoses going onto the injector pump. This one is the vacuum stop to turn the engine off. So when that has suction applied to it, it turns the engine off. And this one here is going to the vacuum pump. Well, it's teed into the actual brake vacuum line. And that is what applies the vacuum permanently to the key inside the car. So when you switch it off, it then sends the vacuum to there and turns the pump off. So although they are completely different lengths, it's worth noting what, what they are and what they do. In this area, you can take off your, um, you might need a flat blade screwdriver just to pop off your glow plug um, relay plug. You're going to want that plug because that whole glow plug relay is going to be used to power the glow plugs in your new vehicle. And I'm going to show you how to do that. These reusable cable ties, sometimes they're a bit brittle, sometimes it's worth just chopping them off, sometimes you can reuse them. Uh, your coolant hoses, you're going to have to take that one off. Um, which goes to the back of the engine um, and you're gonna have to take this one off which goes to the front of the engine. Power steering pump pipe, that's the return. That one doesn't screw in. This one does screw in. This one screws into the original 606 pipe. The return does not. You actually just use a rubber hose. It might lose a bit of fluid but we've got our bucket under there and we're gonna dispose of all that correctly when we're done. Right, so I've just taken the fuel lines off and worth mentioning because they both do look very similar and the pipes are a similar length. Just going to pop a little label on there. It's worth having a roll of masking tape next to you while you're doing this job. Obviously you've got this video to refer to, but it's worth just putting on there which one's the feed and which one's the return because you don't want to get that wrong and then have all sorts of engine misfire issues. So we're going to write feed on there just to say where the alternator goes because you never know what might happen you might strip your car and then you have to go on holiday for six months so i'm just going to write alt on there and then we know where the alternator wires came off expect to get that kind of thing this will all be really disgusting and dirty normally i take the engine and gearbox out of these cars and then take the whole thing outside lift it right up with the forklift and then just literally steam clean the lot blast the old rust off it everything and then bring it back into the workshop and dry it all out. So yeah, we're gonna take the engine mount bolts out, we're gonna take the gearbox mount bolts out, we're gonna take off the gearbox stabilizer, which connects the gearbox to the transfer case. Um, the linkages, I'm gonna take the three linkages off, they're gonna be disregarded anyway, so take them off uh, any way you want. Uh, and also while I'm down here, I'm gonna take off the uh, exhaust. Excuse the camera angle, but this is what I've just taken off. This is the shield that goes on the back of the start motor. It's held on with two 10 mils. You take that off, and then that allows access to the starter motor and above. And you can take off the wiring. You can do it from underneath, or you can do it from on top. Um, so that's all good.
it's all unbolted up its mount and it's literally ready to come out so all you need to do now to get it out is you get your forklift and hook it all up to the engine and then that's it you just pull it out and then you put your new one in which is great if you don't have a forklift of course then you're gonna have to use something else like um, I don't know you'll have to make something either use like a, a dinosaur or a helicopter or something like that a dinosaur or a helicopter I can't think of anything else that would work oh uh, you could fill the engine with helium so that it floated out that would be another way of doing it as well How do you feel? Fort, you know, helicopter. Yeah, helicopter, dinosaur, whatever you've got that can... <clears throat> we need to... This valve here sticks out too far for the 606, so that has to be relocated. Normally what I do is I cut this pipe shorter and mount it that way instead, so that it's actually tucked right back there, and then the cable still reaches. You don't have to do any huge modification for that. Cable system, all this lever, that all just goes in the bin, because I use a completely different type of system for that. That's what your G-Wagon should look like with no engine. And that took, well, in between dealing with customers and messing about and cutting off broken things and all that kind of thing, that probably took about, I don't know, two hours, something like that. Um, and that involves all of your corroded parts and bits and pieces. So realistically at home, if you haven't done one of these before and you have a nice good day at it, you, you'll probably do it quite easily. It's the morning after the night before and I'm gonna show you what to take off your engine. You're gonna take this off, cause you're gonna need that. You're gonna take your water temperature sensor out cause you're gonna need that in your 606 engine. You're gonna take your oil pressure switch out now these are naughty. Little screw in the end of there, don't lose it. It's a strange size. They have a tiny little flathead. You can see why I chopped that wire off rather than trying to undo it whilst in situ. I just pop a new terminal on them. I do not waste any time trying to undo it because nine times out of 10, you can't. If you're reusing your uh, original rubber engine mounts, then unbolt them at this stage from the mounting arms because you're gonna need them. And apart from that, you're good to go. So we're over by the crate engine now, and I'm onto the alternator fitting stage, alternator brackets on all the other bits. Obviously, if you're buying a crate engine, you're not gonna need to worry about the background of what I've had to do to this engine and all the rest of it to get it to this stage because you will get it and you're just gonna be installing it. However, just to let you know what I've been doing, I've just popped these mounting arms on. We like to use the originals um, because they look great and it's kind of, the right way of doing it. This is a lovely ceramic coated manifold to keep the engine bay temps down and that's what you'll get with the uh, crate engines. It's got the lovely sump on there um, of which we've, we've actually just been machining a batch of sumps um, which is exciting. So what am I doing? Okay this is this is a, a an older alternator the crate engines will come with the new ones or recon ones um, and basically what I've done is I've taken the original alternator wire off the original and literally chopped it off where it comes out of the alternator. So put some new terminals on the end, just one of each of those. Um, we're going to crimp them on, heat them so that they shrink and they create a waterproof seal. Bolt them on there, alternator goes onto the crate engine and then it is literally ready to rock and go in the G-Wagon. The nice thing about these alternators as well is um, there is a WIR fitment. So if you want to run a rev counter, because a lot of G-Wagons don't have them, some do, but if you do want to run a rev counter, then you can. That is a perfect place to take your signal. You've got your engine, you've got your gear locks, and you're gonna come and put them together. There's just a couple of things you need to check before you put them together. Obviously, just make sure your release bearing's in there, because that is obviously removable. Make sure the fork's engaged. We've got the uh, the actual slave cylinders already mounted in there. Um, 
This just has a pipe off cut on it at the minute, but that's just to protect the threads. I'm actually going to put the proper pipe on, which will be supplied. Um, and you're going to make sure this will all be lined up when you receive the setup. So you don't need to really worry, but you can just make sure it's good. Make sure all your bolts are tight. Um, and then you're going to basically align this dowel pin straight into there. And then I like to just have the first bolt, which is the long one with the longest shank, ready to go straight through the top hole and into that one there. Um, once you've got that, then you use the rest of the bolts supplied in the kit. There's like a little bag. They all go in and then put the whole unit in as one because you've already got your mounts on. Oh, you should already have your mounts on. Looks like I forgot to put this one on. See, that's how easily it can be done. That's why I'm making a video for you guys. Right, so what we're gonna do next, I'm gonna cut that pipe, make this valve at that angle so that the valve is straight, so that we can do a nice simple connection. And then um, the battery lead here, the one that went onto the positive terminal, this is the clutch cylinder, which we will drop down there because we don't need that for now. Um, this is the battery terminal and that battery terminal is on the wrong side because the starter on the 617 is on this side, the 606 is this side. So we're going to literally take that off that P-clip there. Take that off as well because we don't need the throttle rod anymore. It's going throttle cable. Um, you can take all this linkage system off because you're not going to need any of it. Uh, take that 10 mil out of there move your battery cable to the other side so you can put it onto the start motor this side and you got your exciter wire and your starter wire as easy as that to go straight on nice 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 this is your turning on and off switch for your heating and uh, it's normally mounted right there and that is in the way and this little bit of pipe is what kind of connects it so take a sharp knife chop through there like i have get rid of that bend and then push this round the corner like that and into this space here. And by doing that, you make room for the cylinder head to be able to go all the way back. Three, two, one. Ceramic coated turbo and manifold. Billet hybrid turbo. The uh, aluminium two piece flywheel on the back there. This is a G Wagon spec engine, as you can probably tell. G Wagon coolant hoses, coolant modification, and obviously, all this ceramic coat and stuff is to keep the under engine bay temps right down for G Wagon builds. And all the water pump pulley as well that we've devised. Obviously one of our high performance injector pumps. This is one of our 7.7mm pumps. Uh, perfectly smooth idle, beautifully phased and calibrated, in-house of course, by yours truly. And, and equipped with the anti-jerk system. So if this is fitted to a manual vehicle, we can put the hydraulic line in and, uh, and really dampen off that, uh, that rack travel movement. That's not available anywhere else. And look how smooth it is, look, no smile, no nothing. Don't believe what you read and see on the internet, kids. Golden shower in the way. Hello. Beautiful. It's gonna tap, but we can't really see it. Look at that, it's spinning backwards and forwards and doing magical things. All under one roof. It's called Toys R Us, Toys R Us, Toys R Us. Yeah, 
sombong, location, ready to go. And now we're gonna put the G-Wagon crate engine back in. And as you can see, this is one of four that we've prepared. There you go, look, all with the gorgeous ceramic manifolds, have all been tested, run, pressure tested, everything. They're good to go and they're going overseas. However, I'm going to show you with this one in this G-Wagon, how to put it in and connect things up. Right, so what have I done first of all? My prop shaft, I've taken the prop shaft off this vehicle. Um, this particular vehicle was a five cylinder OM617 with a manual. So the prop length is like 300 and, I don't know, 350 maybe, 380, something like that. Um, but to run this gearbox because it's longer, because, well, it's better. Um, it needed a shorter prop shaft, so we fitted the shorter, um, and I think some of you guys are going to get some custom made. So, or your original one shortened if you can. So, I've fitted the clutch line, that's ready to go. The, so, the, um, the slave cylinder and the clutch pipe, that just literally, the pipe we supply, hooks up with the banjo we provide directly to the original master cylinder. I'm just taking these power steering pipes off, I'm going to remake them, but this is because it's a right hand drive. You left hand drive guys won't have to worry about that. So when you get your crate engines, uh, you're going to have to put on your rubber mounts or your new ones, whichever you decide. Something that I always do, which is a two second job and it, it's just worth doing. If you actually look at this rubber mount, if you're getting close here, um, here, this corner gets quite close to the turbo return pipe. So I, before I bolt this onto the new engine, I usually just take the side of it and just sand it off on the sander. Uh, and that just makes sure that it doesn't get near that. That part of the mount is fixed with the engine, so it isn't gonna, um, as the engine moves, it's not going to rock into it. Now, the other thing that I also do as well, um, the arm for the actuator, I usually just, with a piece of wood and a hammer, I just tap that off so that there's, you know, nice clearance and that it's not going to hit on the mount. Um, that's quite important to make sure that you get that up and away from there because you don't want the, um, the turbo actuator fouled and not able to move correctly. The block coolant modification pipe, um, I've just tied that little cable tie around the mount there so that that's tucked and out of the way. Um, and also what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tap one of these fittings here because if you look, I've already... Um, Cut back the original heater matrix pipe. I've added on the length of this 19 mil internal pipe. Now that pipe is going to go, it's gonna come out somewhere around here and then it's gonna come down. And what I wanna do is P-clip it down here so that it's clear of all the, the manifold and other bits and pieces because we're gonna to have to connect it. It's not very clear on this one, but we're gonna to have to connect it to this here, this like little tail sticking out. On the crate engines, this one that's going in this car is different. On the crate engines, I put a better fitting on, which is a little bit more easy to, uh, easy to get a seal on. I actually tap the housing on all these ones. Um, can you see it under there? It's nice and shiny. There's one difference if you're doing a right hand drive one, you'll notice the two things that I've done. Right hand drive one, I've taken the power steering pipes off. The reason for that is it doesn't give room for the fan. Um, so I just replaced those with a flexible braided stainless hose and P-clip them to the frame. And the other thing that I've done, because this is a right hand drive one, um, spacer on the, on the mount. So you just want to put, that's 12 mil spacer. Uh, and the reason for that is because the back of the head here on the 606 with it being quite wide, it gets quite close to the, uh, to this master cylinder. Um, you won't have to worry about that if it's left hand drive, but um, that's all it takes just to make it to make it work. Everything else is original factory Mercedes. So, uh, so yeah, right. I'll update you with the next bit once I've got it in. Thanks. Little basic update. Um, just showing you, I did have the coolant pipe uh, connected directly to the uh, to the water thermostat. I've actually changed that. Um, I'm just gonna mount it directly to here to the actual pipe on the back of the thermostat housing. Apologies for the paint not sticking on the rubber pipe um, on there because it's quite hard to get to when 
the engine is in the car. So it's better to mount that there. Also, pop your P-clip on your block um, as well to keep that pipe down. Now, something worth bearing in mind, all if you're gonna do a conversion like this yourself at home, all of my manifold, turbo, everything is ceramic coated. That's massively keeping the temperatures down of those components. So, you notice how close my mount is and all that. This is all factory, I haven't made any of this. This is genuine Mercedes stuff, but you can see it's close. Um, if you're not going to ceramic coat these things, then your water pipes and you know your mounting and everything's gonna need some sort of shielding. So that's maybe worth considering. Right, so we're at the point now with the bits of pipe um, and other things that are hard to access once it's in the car. I might put the bottom hose on now just because it's nice and easy just to connect it on there. Um, all that kind of stuff comes in the kit. So I'm going to mount that up and then I'm going to stick it in. So, a few little updates. As you saw, I did change the position of this water pipe. I've fitted the bottom coolant hose. All that kind of stuff's going to come with your conversion kit. Uh, I've fitted the oil cooler pipes, which are nice and assuaged, and they basically come with like uh, a nice screw on end to go directly onto your radiator, which is nice. Um, and the most important thing, I've been trial fitting the, uh, the gear lever assembly, because it's nice to just try it, make sure it all fits before you put it in there, because it's quite hard to access once it's above your head. Um, so, what does that consist of? And what on earth is it? We'll have a look. So this array of parts here um, is basically what we've created to make the BMW uh, ZF six speed fit into a G-Wagon. Obviously the engine to gearbox adapter isn't here. That's a separate thing, um, which you can have a look on the website or I can show you separately. I might even put a photo in as a link. But these are the bits to make the gearbox fit in this car. Now, this obviously is a, a mount that goes on the back of the transmission. A rubber mounting goes onto the bottom of there. This um, basically clamps to the original car's uh, G-Wagon's uh, chassis tube, like the round tube. You can see that one is sat loosely just on the chassis tube there. That's obviously just loosely sat there. And when you mount one of these, um, these are made of a real high grade uh, alloy, um, like a top fuel dragster con rod. Um, so good enough for 10,000 horsepower, I think it's going to hold the gearbox in your G-Wagon. So how it works is you put this into position, you get everything aligned, how you're happy, um, and then you tighten the two uh, bolts which clamp it down, clamp it tight to the tube. Then you simply put a hole through the tube um, I think with an 8.5 mil drill bit, and then you go eight uh, M10 tap into the steel tube, and literally a small bolt then pins this so that it can't turn. Bit of Loctite, uh, and then you're never going to have an issue. So that's that, uh, and then the other bits like this. This mounts to the inside of the body. So if you have a look on the gearbox. Um, this, the other little parts you can see are assembled here. We've got the, the shift linkage that we designed and made. We've got the brackets to turn the, um, the shifter into like a solid mounted shifter. And this bolts into the G-Wagon. It's, it's specific, the bolt holes and everything. That obviously goes over there in the car and then the rubber boot goes over the top of that. And then that seals the outside from the inside. So you've got a nice professional sealed uh, boot assembly so that that's all you're not going to get a draft through where your gear stick goes um, and yeah like I said the best thing is just trial fit this uh, and then make sure it goes into all the gears nicely as this one does there is no real adjustment to make on it it's more a case of just trial fitting it because to get you to know basically how it's going to fit because you can't see very much in there it would be amazing if we could literally just mount this with the stick straight in there now, but we can't do that because uh, the prop shaft has to slide into the corresponding um, prop shaft under there, and that wouldn't allow us to go down and then come back up because the shaft obviously wouldn't be able to come up far enough to slip in. 
So frustratingly, we have to just remove this piece, the, uh, the actual shifter section we have to take off so that you let these uh, sort of L sections, they stay on the gearbox, take this off. And then when you come to put it in, you can leave this connected to the gearbox. You're going to have a clip there and two bolts there, and that's going to fix your shifter in. But even those small, simple things can still be a bit tricky. So you want to do as little as possible in there. You don't want to be uh, trying to do too much. So yeah, you can see the mountains there, rubber mountain on the bottom. That's a uh, nice heavy duty rubber. You can, you can change that quite easily. Um, it has a uh, some adjustment in the underneath of this so you can actually slide it to suit your car because all vehicles are maybe slightly different um, so yeah I think I'm going to take this off and I am finally about ready to put this in This morning I'm uh, the main auto electrician here at Diesel Pump UK and I'm going to be performing some uh, some very 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 minor electrical surgery um, and what we're doing is we've taken the original loom off the 617 engine uh, which we're going to reuse um, and we're going to put the correct glow plug ends which I have taken off a 606 loom uh, onto this 617 loom. Now there is an issue 617 is five cylinder and the 606 is six cylinder. Now there's a really, really easy answer to this and that is simply by connecting two connectors to one wire on here. Yes, it really is that simple and yes, it really works. So um, so that's what I'm gonna do first thing. So you take your 617 loom, take it off uh, and just take off the original glow plug ends. We're gonna use some nice, heat shrink connectors so we're going to crimp them on you could solder and use a heat shrink as well i just like to use a crimp and a heat shrink um they've got like some sort of adhesive inside and when they shrink down it actually glues it all together and seals it off so i'm going to do that i'm going to refit it and then that'll be it the glow plug loom will be fitted this will plug into the original temperature sender which i've taken out of the 617 engine screw in there um and it's it's simple as that that is literally your your wiring Apart from the start of the alternator, which I showed you in an earlier video, done. Right on. So I'm installing the glow plug loom, which I've just showed you that I was modifying to go from 617 to 606. I've clipped that on. That's really nice. Uh, I haven't quite snugged it in and put the cable ties and everything on yet, but I just wanted to show you this while we we're on. Um, these are the two sensors that I've taken out of the original 617 engine. This one is the temperature sensor, and this one is the oil pressure sensor. Now, um, if you look here, um, the, uh, the original OM6062 prong sensor just comes out, and this one just goes directly in its place. And then as you can see on the loom, this is all the original 617 loom that I've just put different ends on, that will just plug straight on. So that's really simple. And then this one, the one that came out of the, uh, the the filter housing um, of the 617, that one is going to go into the filter housing of this. Now the thread on this is different, so you can't just directly screw it straight in. So uh, sometimes you have to make an adapter. Look, look, look. You can see it down there. I've got an adapter on that. You can see I've welded mine, but the ones that I'm going to send out with the customer's jobs, they won't need to be welded because I will buy the right size in stock. Um, you can see I've connected all the uh, glow plugs and I've connected up the um, uh, temperature sensor. I'm just literally now tightening up the starter motor wires, which I showed earlier on in the video where I moved them from the right to the left. I have to... Uh, Off, uh, 
that twin turbo kit we made. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, Riley. and then installing the transfer case support mount. So on a G-Wagon, because the transfer case and the transmission are two separate components and they have a drive shaft in between, they have like a torque arm that goes from the transfer case to the gearbox. So when the two items move, they, they don't put force on each other and they don't move heavily out of alignment. So, because we've obviously done a custom gearbox, we've had to make a custom mount to do that. So it's a nice billet one, uh, which matches all of our other nice billet bits that hold the gearbox in. And that really nicely connects the two items together. And you can see the arm there, it's like a, this is the original G-Wagon piece that goes to the transfer case. Um, you can see some of our other fancy bits there. Look, you can see the clutch line as it goes up there, braided, and the adapter plate, and look at the exhaust. This is also finished today, so always have a flexi. This is two and a half inch because it's 300 horsepower setup that increases to three inch exhaust silencer and a three inch tip. And if you want to build a system that doesn't drone, three bigger is better. So the larger the actual pipe, the less chance there is of the exhaust droning. So it's nicer to have that larger exit at the end. So there you go, and we're getting pretty close to it now. We've got left um, airbox has to go in, radiator has to go in. G-Wagon update, what on earth are we doing? Well, the air system needs to pull air from outside of the vehicle to feed this hungry monster. So what we need to do is have some sort of induction like this, however, this particular customer and many others like him wanted a more slimline design. So we need to design a side vent that fits in front of the battery tray on a left-hand drive would be normally here. So it has to be in front of that uh, and then go directly into our airbox. This is a four inch intake pipe. Um, however, because this narrows down, we're having to reduce this to three and a half because it physically is such a small space to try and get a, a vent, an intake vent. And this is the most similar to the original G-Wagon design. You often see a vent this sort of size and style in the wing. So we're wanting to keep it nice and original in that way. So we're just perusing through some different designs um, of how we're going to do it. And it's going to be billet aluminium and then anodized or whatever finish we decide to put on it. Nice and subtle looking with some bolts and then a neoprene gasket, a little bit like the one that I have on my snorkel. This one obviously is fabricated because it goes up into a four inch intake, but you can see it's similar. A four inch pipe goes through there, around the corner, into the air intake, and then around lots of ceramic goodness. But you can see um, the nice foam filter that goes between and the nice crackle black finish. So yes, this is the step one of designing a new part. The next step will be to decide on a drawing, do a 3D drawing, and then mill some aluminium. Milling of aluminium to come. So this is the diagram that we have now translated onto the uh, 3D, well, it's not 3D yet, it's two dimensional, but the modeling software. And this is then going to be modified to have fins and all sorts of other fancy things put in it so that uh, it looks all cool on the side of the wing. And then that can be translated over to the milling machine and then we can make millions of them. Millions. And millions of dollars. Dollars. Part one million and three of the G-Wagon install, we are making, well I say we, 
Luke, is making um, the vent for the side wing for the air intake. And this is the prototype. Carry on. Um, and at the minute, we're just testing uh, what looks best with the depths of the fins and the other little bits and pieces. So it's just a case of trial and error with it at this stage and then putting it up to the car to see what looks right. We're just going a little bit deeper with them currently. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we're jumping between jobs a little bit, but as you can see, the CNC machine is busy making another side vent. And I have one that we prepared earlier. Ta da! So let's go see where that sits and how it's going to be fitted. Ta da! Ta da! -da. So the taped bit was like the original design, and then that's the actual thing. <laughs> so from drawing on wing to actual beautiful billet part. So this is obviously going to be coated. We're thinking matte black, because I think that's going to suit the, the overall look of the car. And then if you look at the back, um, this neck is going to be welded to a length of pipe, uh, aluminium pipe. And this hole will be cut in the wing and then there'll be a corresponding hole cut in the other side of the wing. And this section welded to a length of pipe will slide all the way through and then a rubber connector, a silicon connector, just goes between the two. And then that allows that entire air system to be fully sealed and just pull air from there, which is going to be absolutely brilliant. And if water does happen to get into there, which inevitably it might if you're steam cleaning the car, um, we drill um, some just small drain holes in the very bottom of the air box and that just allows that water to drain away. So there you go, sort of from prototype to real thing. And soon we'll be showing you the finished product bolted on the car. Sweet. Hello and good morning. So this morning, um, we aren't fitting the air vent yet uh, because uh, we've got that designed up and Luke's on with doing that on the CNC. And I'm going to just show you how to install the intercooler. I'm going to get the radiator, uh, plumb the oil cooler in, and basically get this front end cooling package all finished up this morning. Um, so, this is the intercooler. Uh, it's something that we have uh, tried and tested and developed. It's heavily criticised in the G-Wagon world because um, because if you don't understand something, you criticise it. Um, and basically, the reason why we do this is G-Wagons have a hard time cooling. They have uh, not a great deal of airflow um, through the front end. And the engines, packages and things that people want to put in them are far more powerful than what they were originally designed for. So, to get around that, um, we have to put a uh, large intercooler, large radiator and all the rest of it, but what you cannot do is cover one up with the other, because you end up with a Robin Peter to pay Paul situation where one item's cooling is stealing from the other. So we've used a kind of a method like Mercedes did, where the actual cooling for the intercooling etc is mounted lower down in the bumper area, just like a G63 is. The G63, if you look at its front bumper, it's got more cooling area and radiators in that than the actual main engine cooling radiator. So we kind of basically utilised that, but we had to make it more rugged than a G63 is for your hardcore off-road enthusiasts. So this is what we came up with. It's kind of um, the intercooler sits inside uh, a steel fabricated sort of armoured guard, and this basically fits um, that right here, I'll show you that now. watch. So it sits, the original steering guard would sit on these two pads on the end of the chassis rails. So we've utilised the exact same positions. We've integrated these towing eyes as well, so that you, uh, you yeah. have a little bit better towing ability. Uh, to pull you out of mud, etc., than you did with the original. And this basically, I just moved these pipes. 
This basically just sits right on there like that. And if the camera, so it literally is as simple as, and it's great while all the front bumpers off. It's very very easy to access everything. And this still allows good bumper clearance and all the rest of it. Uh, it doesn't drastically reduce your uh, ground clearance or anything like that. We've literally pulled it and tucked it as tight up as possible so that it's not hugely dissimilar to the, uh, to the original steering gear. And it's really tough stuff. So what also comes in the package uh, with your intercooler mount is your intercooler hoses. Um, which I will show you. They look like this. We have one for the uh, for the boost uh, side, for the turbo side, and that one's just a straight pipe. It has a uh, reducer elbow on the bottom, and then we have this curved one, which goes down the other side, past the chassis rail to the inlet manifold, and then into there. So I'll show you how to install all of those on the 460s. When we put these in, 463 radiator gives much, much better cooling. So we've devised this. Um, this is in raw aluminium, which hopefully the later versions will be uh, um, anodized. And this basically is a cross member that bolts in place with the original and then allows you to fit the, uh, the W463 radiator, which is like that. Different, completely different. Uh, that gives way better cooling. It's a much better system, um, but this gives you an option to do it professionally. So we're gonna fit this first. We have to do this first, as I realized this morning when I keenly came to put the intercooler on, and then realized that I had to put this on first. A little bit of Loctite on my kittens. closely at how it's mounted, the offset is to the rear of the vehicle. So if you look, the, um, you can see that the, the bushes are behind the center line of the mounting bolts. Um, right, we'll get that tightened up. Right, so we've got the radiator in, we've got the intercooler and uh, some steering guard mounted. Have a look at this beautiful machined aluminium. So that sits nicely on there. We use the original uh, g wagon 463 brackets which is good and then uh, if you have a look what I'm doing right now um, the oil cooler hoses which come from the uh, oil filter housing two uh, reinforced hoses that come down there I'm literally just uh, tightening them up on there. When it comes to installing this be very very careful and make sure that you keep it, the hoses to suitable places so that it's not rubbing. You've got to remember this engine when it's running is going to be rocking side to side and it'll, it'll change the hose. So just make sure that, uh, you know, from the, from the filter housing to the radiator that those hoses are correctly secured uh, and hopefully you will end up in that situation. Right, I'm going to tighten this up, I'm going to put the cross member on and the front end's coming together quite quickly. Um, because we made everything fine. Right. Right, so the radiator's in, the bottom cross member's back on, just putting the cross, top cross member back on. And if you've ever worked on a G Wagon, you're going to go, <laughs> yeah. Because for some strange reason, when you take the cross, cross member out the top of these, the two wings literally spread apart. So when you come to put it back on, it's always a bit of a. Uh, and you literally need to just push those two wings back together to get the bolts in. So don't think it's abnormal when you have to do that. So simply a case of getting the system, and we both have to push on each side, like that, stick the bolt in, and then that's it. And then you can get all your other bolts in, they're all lined up. Now, the other thing is, obviously, because we've gone 463 radiator conversion, you can see the original mounting bracket holes for the original vertical floor radiator were there. 
Uh, and now, obviously, with these 463 brackets, we've calculated the correct height on the bottom mount, so this all sits right. It's a case of getting that where you're comfortable, just into the right place, drilling through and literally a nut and bolt before you put the grill and everything on so that they're nicely down. If you want to go all the way to town, which I would be tempted to do, um, just tack a nut to the back. And then if you ever want to pop the radiator off in a hurry, you don't have to take the grill off. You can just buzz the top bolts out. Um, so that's it. I'm going to do that now. And then um, I'm going to put the rest on. It's coming together really quickly. It's not even dinner time yet. I'm starving. So long. Right, so we're on the intercooler section of this video. And uh, the intercooler's already in. We've already mounted it up inside the chamber. Uh, and the next thing is we need to get it piped up. So there's two different versions. Um, there's the uh, left-hand drive version, which this side boost pipe, the left-hand side of the car boost pipe, is, uh, is quite straight. Or oh, there's the uh, UK version, uh, right-hand drive, should I say, version, uh, where it's a curve, and I'll show you the difference. So the one I'm put in today is obviously to a right-hand drive car, and it goes up between the chassis rail here and the inner wing. It goes in that gap there. So that the pipe goes up there like that. Look how nice that pipe is. All crackle black, TIG welded. Beautiful, beautiful. Swaged ends. We make these in-house. So that goes up there. And then it sort of, when I wiggle it into the right place, like that, it goes up to the inlet manifold and then on the bottom here we have one of our beautiful matte black and look how thick they are like the most reinforced and heavy duty boost pipes you've ever seen in your life boost connectors should i say uh, and that just literally is as simple as push that onto there and then if the clamp will allow me push that onto there so push that on there and that's it then it's just a case, what I normally do is, if, it, if you are building a right-hand drive one, um, this inner wing is normally a little bit tighter to the chassis rail, and I just prise it out a little bit. It's usually about an inch closer in, and it's just a case of getting a piece of wood and just prising it out so that it doesn't rub on your boost hand. Um, then on the opposite side, same sort, of, uh, same sort of theory, that literally just goes straight up there, into the bottom of the turbocharger where I've already put on the uh, the silicon hose joiner. Obviously this is not a vertical line. So if you were to take a central point, this is all fairly rough. Um, you can see I'm measuring from 100 mil. That is just uh, something that you do in engineering. You don't tend to measure from the end of the tape because there's play in it, so you tend to measure from 100. Just remember to take the 100 off the other end. Right, so measuring from 100 uh, millimetres, um, we have about 430. So basically that tells us that 330 mil from the centre of this wing line to the central point of that and then the actual uh, the circle for the hole needs to be just on the actual if you look at the, the shape of the wing it has a curve so you want to be the circle wants to be just on the bottom edge of that curve so when you draw it on you know put some tape over and literally draw that circle to the bottom of there and it should be the top of the circle should be literally just on the start of this radius and then you know that you've got it in the right place. So 330 mil from that back edge to there, and then this uh, circle, 90 mil, 89 mil, wants to be centralized between those two points. Right, so now you know and you're certain, you're confident, so confident you're gonna cut a hole in this wing. Pilot drill first. Now you might wanna pop it, the masking tape actually helps you to it not wander everywhere. Right, so we pop that through first. Yep, and you check that there's no wiring behind, of course, before you do that. <laughs> um, and then uh, you're going to go straight in with the big boy. 
Now, you're going to have to order one of these online or get one from your local... Well, it'll be mainly American customers, I would imagine, buying these kits. So what do they have in America? It's not B&Q or Halford, it's like Home, Home Depot. <laughs> or what's the other thing? Harbour Freight. Harbour Freight is like their tool. If you're American, you're watching, you'll be going, oh yeah, hell yeah. We don't know what Harbour Freight is here. We have like um, Halfords. Right, so you take your three and a half inch hole saw or 89 mil to the French and uh, we're going to go straight in the side of the wing there, right on the crosshairs that have been drawn. Right, so just take your time, we're not trying to win any races here. Wanna, you want to have your drill in the first gear setting. Right, so there you go. Access to your wheel arch. And that's beautiful. And that will allow you, I'm gonna brush this up, and with the power of editing, we'll show you that and it'll be fitted. Bye. Right, so using this as a guide, we're just literally going to, um, to, to work out, basically between this strengthened section and this grommet here, that we're going to want to drill the bulkhead roughly in line with one of these holes obviously it has to be fairly in line otherwise it'll put excessive pressure on your throttle cable so um you're going to want it at kind of like that angle so it's parallel to the bulkhead get a rough idea of the cable if it was straight put a mark on the bulkhead drill it through you want to be about six six point five six to six point five um and then put your bulkhead fitting in i'll do that now and then I'll show you what that looks like. thing to make absolutely certain is that you are getting the full lever travel on the injector pump. So if you can uh, just put your foot down. Right, so is that maximum? Yeah. yeah. Right, this is maximum. Now if you can do this, and you've got a little bit of extra movement, you are missing out on valuable horsepower and RPM. Do not underestimate that. So, make sure that you take up the whole travel. Now you can see I've got it on the top linkage there. I could simply move it to the bottom linkage to get that extra bit of travel that I'll need. So I'm gonna do that now, and then hopefully all will be well. Right, I've moved the cable down to the lower linkage. As you can see, there's two ball joints, and if there isn't on your particular version, um, you will get a ball joint with the kit so you can insert that. Right, accelerate, go all the way down to the maximum. Yeah, make sure it's at right down. Yeah. yeah. So then we try and move it and we've got no movement. That is absolutely solid. So we're getting full throttle lever travel. Right, I'll show you what that looks like inside the car. Thank you. Um, and that's what we've got. So it's um, on the second hole on this particular one. Um, when that is correctly uh, seated that little clip that little piece goes into there um so obviously do your adjustments with that in i uh, i'm quite happy with that so that's bolted onto there it takes a couple of minutes just to bolt that up i use a little loctite on it uh, and you can see down the back how the bulkhead fitting goes into it and how it moves and it just pulls on the throttle and that's it really nice robust simple uh, and beautiful throttle cable accomplished well i'm going to tidy up that cable and route it back but apart from that accomplished right so next in the lineup of bits that are going to fit i'm going to go for fit the gear stick and gator right so we made this gear selector surround you can see on the back, I've just stuck some, uh, it's a, just a soft foam neoprene that I've stuck to the back of the aluminium, uh, just to give a better seal. Some people might want to use a sealant, uh, you know, like a, a body sealant, but I just had some old strips of um, neoprene foam that I had left over from the air boxes that we make. So I, uh, I've, I've, I've covered the back in that. Uh, and then that is the gator, which is uh, basically a, a, a drive shaft gator. 
and if I just with the use of a torch right so we can see there is the uh, the hole where the gear selector comes through um, you can see that is our um, billet shifter with its nice short shift um, and basically what's going to happen is I'm going to slide this sorry it's a bit difficult to hold the camera at the same time I'm going to slide this over the top of there like that making sure I'm not trapping any wires or anything like that. And like I said, I've used some neoprene, but you can use sealant or you can use anything you'd like, um, just basically to try and keep a, a nice uh, uh, draft tight seal. So uh, we put that in first, and then we've got the, uh, the four bolts. And basically you're gonna fit this gator over the top, put a cable tie around the, uh, the bottom so that it doesn't pop off. Um, and then that's it, that section will be sealed uh, from the inside to the outside. You can also see there, I drilled a small hole in the floor. It's difficult to see because it's just under that sound insulation, but I drilled a small hole to bring up the wiring for the reverse switch. Because um, on this BMW gearbox, the wiring, the reverse switch comes from the gearbox as opposed to the Mercedes, it's on the stick. Uh, and there you can see the old reverse wire there. So we need to make a connector that goes between there and there to make the reverse light switch work. But I'm going to get the uh, this done first, bolt that down, and then um, and then yeah, we can just make sure that all fits, nothing catches, and that we're good. Right then, so what I've done is I've taken the die grinder and I have literally just taken a little bit off that edge. So you see how normally it has this edge. Well, I've taken it away a bit so that it kind of uh, clearances now on yours at home. You shouldn't have to do that, but on the right-hand drive model the engine is spaced very slightly on the right hand mount um, to clear for the uh, the actual um, brake cylinder so i think that that has had some effect on the design because it was tested and tested and tested before we put it into production and then yeah but anyway even if you do have to do this it, it just took me five minutes with the die grinder um so yeah i'm gonna bolt that in i'll test it again and if it's good we'll button it up and to continue this exciting day with lots of fancy powder coated and billet bits, look at this. This is the um, the gear lever and gear lever extension to extend the shift mechanism that we already have. So the you can see in there, the uh, the boot is already fitted, um, and uh, and then this simply this will come with all the gearbox kits. One of these simply slips over there. You tighten up the the bolts, and then the original gear gator simply slips over it and it, the feel of it is absolutely fantastic really nice clicky um, and a very positive feel obviously you could have this any length you wanted but i thought that that felt like a nice comfortable uh, working height um, i've also mounted the boost intake pipe as you can see i've put a little bit of insulation over the pipe that goes from the breather system down into here because it's good to keep that vapor uh, nice and hot and then it doesn't try and condense and then drip into the turbo it stays as vapor and goes around the system it inevitably will condense when it gets to the intercooler but that's just like on mine i have an open breather that goes straight to the floor but i don't think that's like the correct thing to do so um yeah we've also got the powder coated bra bra brackets on the air intake box now i've got the uh engraved polycarbon at top to go on there the four inch air filter also to go in there throttle cables all connected as you've seen and all the other bits and pieces so we've just literally got a case of already done the oils um i've got my list so let's have a quick look at the list to see what i've done since last time we did some ticking off engine oil i've done um refit the header tank i've done Fit powder coated air box bracket, I've done. Fit TIP, which is turbo inlet pipe, I've done that. Uh, engine cover air box lid, I've just said. Power steering fluid and coolant. Uh, and obviously, I need to also write on there gear lever. And then we'll be done. And then it'll be test drive time. Excitement. Oh, and remember, at this stage, while you're quite close to the end, get your battery charger out and start charging your battery because the chances are you might have had this off the road for a few weeks and it's going to take quite a bit of cranking to get that engine started so just
charge your battery up now. Have it slow charging. Thinking ahead. Right, I'm going to do some more and we'll be running soon. Right, so I'm going to put the air filter into the air box and I thought this would be a good time to show you how it works, how it fits. Basically, it's a four inch neck filter that we use inside our air box, obviously for a good flow. But I think the 230mm one, so you could put um, you know, a four inch neck filter of any description into our box. They're very robust. The box is all aluminium. Um, so, you know, even if this starts to get tatty and tired in 10, 20, 30 years time, you could have it um, sandblasted and repowdered. So that's a nice factor. Make sure your Jubilee clip's facing up because you won't be able to get to it if not. It is quite tight to get in. So what you generally have to do is locate it over the end of the pipe and then you push this so you're like bending the rubber at the bottom. Push that over the lip like that. Literally just wiggle it over the neck and into position. And then, when you're happy with it, tighten up the plug. Right, it's come to that point. Fill all your levels, make sure everything's perfect. Check your oil, um, check your coolant level, uh, power steering fluid, all of your fluids, because it's time to start the engine. We're gonna start it up with that off so we can check for any leaks, because as you can see, this area here is kind of a business end where you've got coolant pipes and you've got on this particular model, you can see quite a strange arrangement of pipes here, and it's because I have a Y section that feeds back to the coolant matrix. Um, sometimes people mount the header tank on the other side and that wouldn't be there. So um, for the next model, I'm going to actually make the pipe, the hard pipe itself Y off, so it looks a little bit neater. But um, this is a bit of a prototype. So um, anyway, you'll be able to check all your pipe work, your oil cooler pipe work, uh, your power steering pipe work, everything from here by leaving that off. Everything's ready to go, we're going to fire it up. Are we ready for this? First start of this G-Wagon. Well, I say first start, the engine has been started and the engine started before, so it's sort of is primed up. But yeah, let's give it a go. Remember to wait for those low plugs, people. Remember we need to connect uh, our two boost reference lines, one, ah, actually just one, because this particular turbo has a feed return actuator on the turbo housing. So we only need one of these to go to the album. We'll block the other one off. If you wanted to, you could potentially use that other one for a boost gauge or anything like that if you wanted. Um, so we're going to connect that, couple it all up, new gasket, all these engines are obviously going to be supplied with the gasket. Um, and then take it for a road test, it's about that time. Excitement. Back in now.
to go in your plane with you. <laughs> there is no chance. <laughs> Mate, that, that's awesome. That's, Brilliant. That's a good job, mate. I love it. Love it. And yes, hardcore diesel fans, it does do donuts, drips, burnouts and all that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.